Good morning, YouTube. My name is Ian from Big Rock Adventure. Today we're going to talk about the Honda XR650L, the Kawasaki KLR650, and the Suzuki DR650SE. What are the differences between these bikes, and what would be the criteria you look at in choosing between them? These bikes have been around forever, but they're still very relevant in today's world. So today we're going to take a look at these three bikes and figure out which one might be best for you. So like I said, these motorcycles have been around for a very long time. Some of them are almost as old as me. The KLR came out in 1987 and then of course was revised in 2008 for the second generation. The DR650 came out in 1996 and the Honda XR650L came out in 1993. So these are old school 650cc carbureted motorcycles and they're kind of an endangered species right now. So the Kawasaki is liquid cooled and the Honda and the Suzuki are both air oil cooled, so they don't, they don't have radiators with coolant. These motorcycles are often the choice of world travelers or people going to remote places for long distances because they're simple, they're reliable, they're easy to work on, they're relatively lightweight compared to a modern adventure bike, and they're just something that people trust uh, way out in the boonies. Now for myself, I've owned uh, six KLR650s over the years, and I've also owned a DR650, which I extensively modified for dual sport riding. While I haven't owned an XR650L myself, I have ridden them, but I have owned other Honda XR models, including an XR250, an XR400, and an XR600R. I've also spent some time on Honda's XR650R, but please don't get that confused with the XR650L. The R model is a liquid-cooled, uh, more modern engine design, which Honda brought out to compete in the Baja 1000 race. The XR650L engine design dates way back into the 80s or 90s uh, with some of their older models, um, hence being an air-cooled bike and, and much simpler. It's also much lower power than the XR650R, so don't get those confused. The XR650R was never offered as a street-legal motorcycle. So the question is, how are these bikes different and how would you choose between them? So we're going to talk about some of the specs real quick and then we're going to get into some details. So I'm going to put the specifications up here so we can go, go over them. Um, a few things you want to notice. There are big differences in how these bikes are set up. Um, some are obviously more oriented towards the street and some are more oriented towards off-road. So let's get power and torque out of the way. Um, and the discussion on power and torque is really simple for these bikes because they all have around the same amount of power. There might be small differences, but honestly, from trolling the internet, it's hard to figure out how much different they really are. So I'm just listing them all as around 35 horsepower and around 40 foot-pounds of torque. So really, these bikes are not powerhouses, right? They're old school designs, and this is just the power you get. And so these bikes really aren't di that much different in terms of their power output. So we can kind of take that off the table in terms of comparing them. So when we dive into the specs, there's a few things that become apparent right away. The KLR650 is by far the heaviest motorcycle here, and that's largely because it's a liquid-cooled engine, it has a, much lar it has a larger frame, much more fairings, um, you know, headlights, a windshield, a, a larger dashboard. It's, it's just a bigger motorcycle with more, uh, more components to it, and it's, just, it's always been a heavier motorcycle. And really, Kawasaki kind of developed it more as a street bike that could deal with potholes and maybe some dirt roads, whereas the other bikes were more developed to go off-road, actually, from their, from their inception. So in terms of weight, you know, you've got the Kawasaki coming in at 420 pounds wet. Now keep in mind that's for the second generation bike. The DR650 is much, much less at 365 pounds, and then the Honda's our lightweight champion here at 345 pounds. Now 345 pounds is not lightweight by modern standards for a dual sport bike at all. I mean, uh, to keep in mind that a KTM 500 EXC, which granted is an $11,000 bike with much higher maintenance, but that bike weighs in 250 pounds and has far more horsepower than this Honda does. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about these bikes that you can buy for two or $3,000 on Craigslist all day long. So this is a much different comparison. Another thing that stands out immediately to me is the ground clearance. So the Kawasaki is way down there at eight inches of ground clearance. The Suzuki's kind of in the middle at 10 inches, and then the Honda's way up there at 13 inches of ground clearance. That's a huge difference for going over off-road technical terrain, rocks, logs, things like that. The price you pay, of course, is the seat height. So then that's an important thing we need to talk about. So the seat height on these bikes, which is how, you, how easily you can reach the ground, or, or how easily you can't reach the ground in some cases, um, 35 inches for both the Honda, I'm sorry, 
35 inches for both the KLR and the Suzuki, but 37 inches for the Honda. So that's how they're getting some of the extra ground, ground clearance. Now I do want to note that the Suzuki can be lowered. Uh, it has built-in lowering uh, ability, so you can drop the forks by kicking out a spacer and, and some sort of a spring, and you can um, change the rear shock. I believe you, you flip the linkage or flip, a, flip something around and you maybe reverse the spring, and you can lower the bike like an inch and a half or two inches, which is a huge deal, which would get its seat height down to 32, 33 range. Um, it does take away some of your suspension travel, but if you're a shorter rider, the DR is probably going to be the top of your list for these bikes. So in terms of suspension travel, this is gonna be along the same lines here. You're kind of noticing a theme, right? That the KLR is kind of the street bike and the others are the off-road bikes. So if you look at the suspension travel, the KLR only has 7.9, the Suzuki has 10.2, and the Honda has 11.1, .1, which is a lot of travel, especially for back when this bike was introduced. Let's look at their fuel capacity. So everyone knows the KLR is a tanker. It's got that six gallon fuel tank, which is actually more like 5.7 or 5.8, but Kawasaki can never get their specs right. The Suzuki has 3.4 and the XR has 2.8. So people who own the Suzuki's and the Honda's, one of the first things most people do is put on a larger fuel tank. And there's, there's really affordable options to do that. Slap on a larger plastic tank, four or five gallons, whatever you want, and, uh, and then you're fine. So when you look at this weight, I mean, this is a big deal. This is something that's gonna make a huge difference in how the motorcycle handles and feels and how it is to ride off road. Um, you know, there's, there's a 80 pound difference or maybe 75 pound difference between the KLR and the Honda. That's a huge deal. Now, yes, if you add a larger fuel tank to the Honda and a windshield, um, you're gonna regain a little bit of that weight, but still, how does Kawasaki even make that KLR so heavy? I honestly don't know. So let's talk about a few other differences between these three motorcycles. So I wanna talk about the aftermarket, the maintenance, reliability, and the off general off-road and on-road performance. So in terms of aftermarket uh, products, they all have a pretty good aftermarket going for these bikes since they've been going for so long. I think the KLR being the most popular motorcycle here has the largest aftermarket, and, but the DR and the Honda are still pretty good. You can still go onto places like Rocky Mountain or or Revzilla or whatever it is, and still find a lot of parts for these bikes. So that's great. Um, on the maintenance front, the KLR is a little bit more work on the maintenance. Not necessarily more often, but just a little bit trickier to do. The KLR has valves that require shims, and you have to take the camshafts, um, you have to lift out the cams to change the valve shims. The, K the Honda and the Suzuki have screw adjust valves, so they're very easy to adjust. A few other things that make the KLR a little bit more work on the maintenance, obviously it's a liquid cooled bike. So, uh, you, you know, you've got a radiator to service now and then, but that's not a big deal. Uh, the other thing that makes the KLR harder to service is that you've got a lot more fairing and body panels to remove to get to anything. Whereas the Honda and the Suzuki are more, a little bit more dirt bike style, there's not much to remove. You can kind of get to stuff much faster. In terms of reliability, this is very subjective and you guys should really do your own research. They've all known to be pretty reliable bikes. Um, I think the KLR, and we will get to this towards the end, the KLR does have a few more issues in general than these other two motorcycles do, although each of them kind of has their Achilles heels. So let's talk about off-road and on-road performance. So it's kind of clear from looking at the specs and, and if you've watched other videos out there on these motorcycles, that the Honda is kind of the best off-road with the Suzuki being kind of in between and then the KLR really not being the greatest off-road bike compared to these bikes. Uh, but then when you look at the on-road performance, the KLR is gonna be quite a bit better and there's a few reasons for that. Um, I think the first and foremost for me with the KLR being better on the road is gonna be the wind protection and the comfort. So you've got a comfortable seat, at least on the 2014s and later. You've got, uh, you've got a surprisingly effective fairing. You've got better instrumentation. You've got a tachometer, a big speedometer, some other gauges there on your dash. Um, also, the KLR has a little bit better lighting, but it's still not that great by modern standards. But it is better than the DR and the XR, which have lights straight out of the 90s. So what are some common upgrades that you're gonna to make to these motorcycles? They all have some things in common about in terms of the things that you're gonna to wanna to upgrade. Um, most of them, you're gonna look at upgrading things like skid plates. You're gonna probably change out the steel, the cheap steel handlebars for a stronger aluminum bar. Uh, you're probably gonna put on better lighting. You're probably gonna to have to deal with a seat. Um, except on the, early, the later KLRs, which are more comfortable. So they all have pretty soft suspension, but the exception to that somewhat is the Honda. So the Honda, when it came out in 1993, was a pretty good suspension setup with 11 inches of travel and a cartridge fork in the front that's actually adjustable for compression damping. Um, that puts it quite a bit ahead of the other two bikes here for suspension performance, even though it is a very old motorcycle at this point. 
the Kawasaki and Suzuki uh, for the most part have non-adjustable suspension. Now, when I say that, I'm lying a little bit because I know you can adjust the spring preload on the Kawasaki. I think the Suzuki has spring preload, but it's probably one of those collars. Uh, and I believe they both have maybe rebound adjustment on the rear shock for the uh, Suzuki and the Kawasaki. But overall, the Honda is gonna be the best out of the box suspension here uh, for these motorcycles. So let's talk about specific issues with each of these bikes. They all do have their own Achilles heels. So the KLR, everyone kind of heard about the doohickey, and that, that's a big deal, and I have some videos on the KLR. The other thing that the KLR suffers from are things like really weak subframe bolts where the, where the two parts of the frame can actually separate because the bolts just shear because they're crappy quality. Um, KLRs also have a tendency to burn oil, especially the, uh, the, the ones between like 2008 and 2012 and that, and that time range. They also have a, a much a really soft suspension until 2014, although all the bikes kind of suffer from that. So on the XR650L, there are a few things that keep it from being perfect. So this motorcycle does not have an oil cooler and it tends to run the oil very, very hot. So there's a lot of reports on the internet from guys who are measuring oil temperatures that are alarmingly high. What they're doing to address that is put on things like oil coolers to get that oil temperature down. Because that oil is the only thing cooling your cylinder and piston and all the internals of your engine. So if your oil overheats, it's kind of a problem. So I'm not really sure what Honda was, was doing there with that, um, but possibly maybe they cheaped out and just didn't put an oil cooler on the bike. The other issues with the XR is that it doesn't have a cush drive. I'll put a picture of a cush drive here, but a cush drive is essentially rubber dampers in the rear hub that smooth out the power pulses for the street. That does a few things. It makes the motorcycle feel smoother, but it also prevents, wear on your, prevents excessive wear on your sprockets. I've also heard cases of the front sprocket on the, on the Honda being something like too thin of a wall and something to do with wearing out the countershaft spline. So that's something to look for. So the DR650 has some well-known issues that are not a huge deal, but some things you need to look after. Probably the most famous one is a neutral safety unit screw. So there's a, there's a switch inside under the clutch cover that um, determines whether the bike is in neutral. It's like some sort of electrical switch, but it can, it can, the screw from that can come out, I guess, from vibration or not being tight enough. I think in 2017, someone told me they started putting Loctite on from the factory, but if you have a 2016 or older DR, you need to pull the clutch cover and go in and check your neutral safety sending unit. The DR is also known, just like the Honda, for having an uncomfortable seat. Uh, the other thing that the Suzuki has that you have to look at is the upper chain roller. So I'll put a photo here, but um, it's, it's known to cause problems, so you need to remove that. What about longevity of these motorcycles? So what I mean by longevity is like how long are you going to get sort of on your engine and transmission before you need to start rebuilding stuff? The KLR being liquid cooled in theory should have a little bit better engine longevity because it's keeping things cooler and keeping the, the engine temperature more even throughout the different parts of the motor. But there's other things to keep in mind with longevity. It's gonna depend on, do you keep your valves in spec? Do you clean your air filter? Do you change your oil? So longevity is very subjective, but I think you're gonna have good longevity from these bikes. There's reports from all these uh, models of people with over 50,000 miles and, and having no problems at all. So as long as you keep care of these, I think you'll be okay. So let's get to the final thoughts on these bikes. So these three bikes are you know, legendary really, having come out in the 80s or 90s and still being ridden all around the world by people today. Um, so my personal thoughts on this, because I've owned a lot of KLRs and I've had a DR that I really modified for off-roading, is that the DR is you know, a good middle of the road bike for doing really 50-50 riding. The KLR is also good at 50-50, but it leans more towards the street. If you're more of an off-road focused rider, you're obviously leaning towards the XR or the DR, uh, probably with preference to the Honda. For me, when I would ride my DR and KLR back to back, I always felt that the DR had a little bit more snap to it, a little bit better power, but I think that's to do because it's about 60 or 70 pounds lighter, not so much because it makes more power, but because the power to weight ratio is better. I think what it comes down to on these motorcycles, if you're looking between the three, is you have to take a hard look in the mirror and decide how much you're riding on the street versus how much you're riding off-road. Now, one thing I didn't talk about was the first generation KLR. I chose not to do that because I'm trying to compare the bikes from the more recent years and Gen 1 KLRs are getting harder to find. But if you can find a Gen 1 KLR, just know this, it's about 20 pounds lighter than the Gen 2. It has a little more suspension travel, but the suspension is still extremely soft. Um, it's kind of similar to the DR650 in some ways. It's got the older headlight, it's got sort of the older, it has less wind protection than the Gen 2, but it still has more wind protection than a, than a DR650. 
The things that really hold back the Honda and the Suzuki on the road are sort of the lack, total lack of wind protection and just a narrower seat and a narrower motorcycle overall. So you just don't get the feeling of protection and, and comfort that you do from the KLR. I think to wrap up, these are all good choices for motorcycles and we're lucky to still have some of them around. The KLR is out of production, at least in the United States and isn't for sale anymore, but you can still buy the Suzuki and the Honda brand new. Now, I wouldn't buy one them brand new at all because they've been the same forever. I would go buy a really clean used one on Craigslist. I hope you guys found this video useful. Please uh, do like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time. Hello, what? Who is this? The stock market crashed. I told you, buy low and sell high. I gotta make my GS payment over here. I gotta buy coffee. I gotta buy more fog lights for my bike. People would just subscribe to my channel and like my videos. Maybe I'd actually make some money off this thing. Well, you're, you know what? You're fired.